The past is preparation. Y your past is preparation. E every element of your past is preparation by God to shape you into the future person that he needs you to be. And what if there was no element of our past lives, no heartbreak, no divorce, no diagnosis, no, no death, no, no, no grief, literally nothing. What if there's no part of our past life that shouldn't give us hope for the future? In, in fact, what if, what if one of the primary ways God wants to shape us is to use our past to make us into people of relentless, fierce, unrelenting hope for the future. As we kick off a new sermon series on the first Sunday of a new year, that's our question. And so I like to say, let those who have the ears to hear, let them hear in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Andrew Forrest. I'm the senior pastor here at Asbury. I'm glad to have you joining us. Here at Asbury, we're a Bible reading church, and we kick off the new year looking at the book of Exodus, and we're reading through Exodus together. We have these Bible reading guides. They're available. They are free. They only run for six weeks, Monday through Friday, to break down the beginning of Exodus into small chunks, a little bit out of a time. I'd love to have you uh, pick up one of these, and you can see the slide on the screen about picking up your own on the way out. They are available this morning. We're going to run out, but use them, distribute them, and pass them out to your friends. So that starts... Uh, in fact, we started last Monday, but if you start tomorrow, we start Exodus 1-1 tomorrow, so you can do it. Cut your losses, jump on back in. Uh, I'm glad to have you joining us. Folks are wondering where we film those videos in the desert. And you know, it's kind of a shame. These days, people think that like we're filming that in CGI, in a green screen. No, no. We actually suffered and drove to western Oklahoma for that. It was freezing cold. And we got sand everywhere and every camera lens and everywhere else. But it was a lot of fun. There's a place called Little Sahara State Park, about three hours west of here. And it looks exactly like that. Nothing in those videos is possibly uh, edited or added to. It really was like that that day. And it was very cold. And I'm really glad to be here this morning inside. I'm glad for that. And I'm, I'm glad we have a lot of guests with us this morning. I know on the first Sunday of the year, folks are checking us out or visiting or watching online. And I want to say this morning that Whatever your week has been like or your life's been like, whatever you look like, whether you believe what we believe, or even if you vehemently disagree in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, you're welcome in our church this morning. With that in mind, therefore, let's take a breath, quiet our thoughts, and still our hearts, and open our minds to see what God has for us as I begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God. To you, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you, no secrets are hidden. So cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. To that end, O oh Lord, I pray that now you take my words and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them and give us insights. And then, God, I pray that you take our hearts and fill them with hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, Exodus begins in Medias race, in the middle of things. Here's how it starts, with a list of names. In fact, in Hebrew, the name of the book of Exodus is Shemot, which means the names. Here's how it begins. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his own household. Reuben. Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. So the story just begins. You have to know what's come before to understand where we are at this moment. Now, there is a man whose name was Jacob. He gets the name Israel, and he has, if you can believe it, 12 sons through four different women. And you thought things was bad today. Twelve sons with four different women. And as you could probably already guess, it doesn't go well, as you could probably already foresee. But through a series of miraculous events, which I will explain here in a little bit, they end up in Egypt and they flourish. Here's what happens next. Then Joseph died. He's one of the sons and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly, 
They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them. They begin to be enslaved to inflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pitom and Ramzaes. So here you have the descendants of Israel pressed and enslaved. If I were to pause there, you never seen any movies, you never read ahead in the Bible, you never been to Sunday school, would you know what would happen next? Could you possibly foresee? You know, one of the most interesting things I think about human nature is it is a stone cold fact that nobody knows the future. And it is a stone cold fact that everybody thinks he does. You ever notice this? These guys on these sports shouting programs, have you seen these shows? Whenever I get my hair cut, they're playing these sports shouting shows. And they just yell at each other about what's going to happen in the NFL or in the college football games this week. But nobody ever knows. And what's the old saying? That's why they play the game. Nobody really knows. It's so interesting, though, that we think we do. So, so what we do constantly is we extrapolate from our current circumstances what our future reality will be. Now, yes, 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 yes. You might be uh, naive, let's say, in business, and you buy too many of the wrong product. Or yes, you're a kid, and there's a slight chance of inclement weather this week, so you don't do your homework over the weekend. So every now and then, I guess you can get in trouble by being uh, like uh, too optimistic for the future. But I'm just telling you, in my pastoral experience and in my personal life, that's not what gets people in trouble. What gets people in trouble is assuming from a bad current circumstance a bad future outcome. And what happens is, we begin to borrow today tomorrow's possible troubles. And the thing that hasn't even happened yet begins to affect our reality today. It's so interesting how we all do this. So imagine it's 2005. It's the last day of the Masters at the Augusta National in Georgia. And Tiger Woods and Chris DeMarco are leading the field on the final day. Tiger's up by two strokes. It's the 16th hole, and here's what happens next. second cut. Now, for us mortals, that would be like the best shot of our lives. But at Augusta on the last day, when you miss the green, that can be it. I was actually listening to an interview this week with a professional golfer, and he talked about how basically, at that level, anybody has the physical talent to beat anybody else. It's all mental. And what made Tiger so good for so long was just his ice mentality, how he could focus. But one shot can screw up the whole thing because that's what happens. It's very fine margins. So if we pause it right there, is it a good or is it a bad thing that he misses the green on the 16th at Augusta? See, what's interesting about life is that nobody actually knows the future. And yet constantly, we are assuming because of a hard thing in our past, that the future will have nothing any good in it. What's so beautiful about Exodus, I think, is that Exodus is the great story of how God shapes and forms a people. And the first chapters of Exodus are about how God shapes and forms a man whose name is Moses, who will be used by God to bring the people out of slavery. And so Exodus has this great relevance to us because we see in the same way how God was shaping and forming the man Moses, how God is making us today. And it's our past given over to God that makes us into the people we are going to be. 
In fact, there is no element of your past that God cannot use to shape you and to make you and to form you. And whether you are 99 or 9, it doesn't actually matter. It's the same principle. Who you are can be used by God to make you into the person he needs you to be. And as long as you have breath, it means God is not done with you yet, that he has more for you today. So Exodus begins in the middle of things with the people of Israel and Egypt. How and why they got there, you have to go back to the book of Genesis to understand. So you have this man, Jacob, also known by the name Israel. He has 12 sons, and the apple of his eye is the brilliant, immature, 17-year-old boy named Joseph, who, to show his father's favor, is given a coat of many colors. And he functions sort of like a spy against his brothers, and he gives his father ill reports of some of his brothers. And one day, Jacob sends the brilliant boy, the preferred boy, Joseph, out into the field to spy on his brothers. And the brothers see him coming from far off, and they decide to kill him. It's interesting. So much of the Bible we read like children's storybook, like, uh, like Sunday school versions of it, the sanitized technicolor versions. But the Bible is, it's adult. It's heavy. These are brothers who decide to kill their own brother, a 17-year-old boy. So here's what happens next. The story picks up Genesis chapter 37, verses 23 and following. When Joseph came up to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. In the sanitized version, you have the boy just down there looking up at his brothers. But would you stop thinking the sanitized version and start thinking real life? It's a 17-year-old boy. He's thrown down into the cistern. Did he break his nose on a rock going down? Was he absolutely screaming? Have you ever been forced to go a place you didn't want to go? Did he break an ankle? Did he lose an eye? What is it like to hear the screams of a 17-year-old boy, your own flesh and blood, and decide you're going to kill him. And then what happens next will absolutely make your blood run cold. It's such a cold-blooded act. Look, verse 25, then they sat down to eat. How far, how far was their little lunch circle from the pit in which Joseph found himself? Could they hear him crying and screaming? They sit down to eat. This is one of those details in the, in the court documents later that we'd all be fascinated by, just the, the sheer evil of it. They sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites, another people group, coming down from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. It's almost like Judah sees himself as being magnanimous when, in fact, he's trying to profit off his brother's own slavery. And his brothers listened to him. And so then the Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. The brothers end up faking Joseph's death. They take the coat of many colors and they smear animal blood all over and they give it back to their father and tell him that a wild animal ate him. And the father is heartbroken and Joseph finds himself in Egypt where it goes from bad to worse. He's falsely accused of sexual assault and he finds himself in the Egyptian prison. Now, I have been in prisons in Texas in the 21st century through prison ministry and I can tell you, I wouldn't want to spend one hour in prison against my will. And that's today in our modern sanitized version of imprisonment. What was prison like in the ancient world? Imagine the foul, the foul nature of it and the absolute terror of this boy. And he languishes in prison for several years. What's interesting about our lives is that we constantly extrapolate from our current circumstances what our future reality will be. Exodus begins by telling us that a new Pharaoh arises and he has no regard for the children of Abraham, for the people of Israel, and he begins to enslave them. For all intents and purposes, that is a bad event. So you have your own past life in, in 
he had a difficult time growing up. And that has really, really affected the rest of your life. Or you've been battling addiction your whole life. Or you have recurrent pain. Or you have had to fight a terrible diagnosis. Or you've had a, a serious loss or a series of losses. A, an almost unendurable grief has been part of your life these past several years. The problem for all of us, I think, is that we take our current circumstances and our pains and our wounds and our burdens, and we just assume that we know what the future will be like with them. So it's 2005, and Tiger has missed the green on the 16th of Augusta, and any mistakes on the final day of the Masters will probably cost you the most prestigious tournament in golf. So here we are. Here's what happens next. There's a good chance he doesn't get this inside the Marcos ball. Vern Lundquist is calling it that. He says, in your life, have you ever seen anything like that? And I'll tell you what, the marketing executives for Nike had never seen anything that good in their lives. Here you have Tiger, one of the most uh, high-profile athletes in the world, and his ball rests on the edge of the cup with that little swoosh perfectly displayed around millions and millions of television sets before it drops in. What's interesting is that it would have seemed that it was a bad thing to miss the green on the 16th hole. But in fact, that became one of the most important and famous shots of Tiger's career. He went on to win his fourth Masters that day. And I know life is not golf. And I know that a cancer diagnosis or a grief is not the same thing as missing the green. And yet the same principle holds. Namely, you have absolutely no idea. You have absolutely no idea how God is currently working all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. See, Joseph finds himself in prison because his brothers sold him there. But through a series of miraculous events, God places Joseph, who is absolutely brilliant, one of these like once in a thousand year minds. He places him face to face with Pharaoh and Pharaoh is wise enough to see this man for what he is. And he raises Joseph up from the prison to the palace and puts Joseph in charge of the entire kingdom of Egypt. And through his administrative brilliance, Joseph prepares for a future famine. And when the famine comes, not only is Egypt supplied with food, but so are the surrounding nations, including Joseph's own family back in the promised land who had sold their brother into slavery. And they come in and actually find salvation through the brother they betrayed. It's just absolutely amazing when you see the whole sweep of it, how God takes evil things and flips them for good. It's sort of like the story of the Chinese farmer with one major exception. Check it out. I gotta tell you the story of the Chinese farmer. Tell me. There's a farmer and he lives with his son and they have one horse and the horse runs away. And everyone from the town comes by that night and they said, the horse ran away and they say, oh no, what terrible news. He said, I don't know, it's good news or bad news, we don't know yet. And the next day the horse came back with two other horses and everyone from the town came by and they said, what great news, now you have three horses. And he said, well, I don't know if it's good news or bad news. <laughs> and then the next day the son went out and trained one of the new horses and fell and broke his back. Mm. Everyone from the town came by and said, oh no, what terrible news. He said, I don't know if it's good or bad news. And the next day, the constable from the military came by and said, we're taking all able-bodied young men to join the military. And he said, my son has a broken back, he can't go to the army. And then everyone from the town came by that night and they said, oh, what good news, your son didn't have to go to the Stop army. Stop it, I can't handle this. Good news or bad news, I don't know, we'll see. And the idea of this is that it could go on and on and on and on. So the idea of 
missing a green on, I don't know, 16 at Augusta, if you're Tiger Woods, that could be good news because that could be a defining moment when the ball lands on the green and rests on the lip with the Nike logo perfectly showing and then falls in. That's where I go with this idea of wishing things were different. If you subscribe to the idea of the Chinese farmer of good news, bad news, who knows, you cannot believe that there even is bad news. I, I like that, that silly little parable in a way because I like the idea that it shows that you can't ever extrapolate from the current reality what the future circumstances will be. And I think that's broadly true, and I don't think you can actually contradict it. In fact, one of the benefits of living longer is you see that happen more and more and more and more. But the thing that I fundamentally disagree with with that little parable is the conclusion the narrator draws that there is no such thing as bad news. I don't think that's true. In fact, I think the Bible teaches the exact opposite. This might be what online influencers want you to think or some armchair Eastern religious theologians would tell you where suffering is just an illusion. It's the yin and the yang and an infinite regression. But this is not the Bible. The Bible very clearly calls out bad for what it is, opposed to the goodness of God. It is not good that Joseph is betrayed and sold into slavery. It is not good that he is falsely accused and thrown into prison. It is not good that famine comes to the land. And it is absolutely not good when the children of Israel find themselves oppressed into slavery by a wicked Pharaoh. It was not good that you've had that diagnosis. It was not good what you underwent as a child. It's not good that there was an empty chair around the Christmas dinner table this year. Those things are not good. They are, in fact, bad. But what the scripture teaches in Exodus shows us over and over and over again, as we will see, is that the goodness of God is such that the Lord is able to take the evil of this world and twist it and use it for good. This is what Joseph says in one of the best verses in the whole scripture. After Joseph meets his brothers after so many years, and after Joseph becomes his family's salvation when they come down sojourning in Egypt, here's what he says, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. If ever there was a verse to memorize this year, it's Genesis 50, 20. What you intended for evil, God is using for good. I believe that the elements of our past lives ought to make us resiliently, relentlessly hopeful about the future because of the very simple fact that God is working all things for good for those who love him. So, one of the things we don't hear about that often in the West, we're so obsessed with our own horse race of politics and the new election and this or that, who's up, who's down. We miss what God might be doing in the world, including in the Islamic Republic of Iran. There's been lots of protests there, but even that is obscuring what's happening underneath the surface, which is a great evangelistic outreach and a great explosion of the Church of Jesus underground in the ancient Persian kingdom of Iran. So there are two women, both from Muslim backgrounds, Miriam and Marzi, and through a series of miraculous circumstances, separately they became to be followers of Jesus. And they met each other and became fast friends. And although following Jesus is illegal in the Islamic Republic of Iran, and although there are secret police everywhere, and although the government is corrupt and tyrannical and wicked, these women thought it was their responsibility to spread the gospel. Here's a picture of the two of them. Young women in their 20s, and they began to fill their backpacks night after night in the huge Persian city of Tehran and distribute Bibles in the cover of darkness. Over the course of their underground efforts, they distributed 20,000 Bibles. These two 20-something women their campaign was so successful that the Iranian secret police they, police, they found out later, was convinced they were part of a, uh, of a global international conspiracy to smuggle Bibles into Tehran. Really, it was these two brave women. But of course, the inevitable occurred. They were betrayed. They were sat before a judge, sentenced to death for subversive activities and thrown into an interior prison in Tehran, 
nasty, foul place. But what happens when you've already been condemned to death? You've already been thrown into a vile prison by the secret police. What else can they do to you? So they began to pray in their prison cell, crammed, teeming with all these women. And the women began to seek Marzi and Mariam out for prayer because they noticed they had a peace that these women didn't have. And in the evenings, the prison cell's tumult would go quiet and the woman would pray. And they write in their book, they write, and our prison had become a church. They were in prison for 289 days and then through international pressure and the miraculous gift of God, they were freed. And they are now go around telling the story. I heard, I heard Marzi give her testimony back in the fall. And it's amazing to hear what God is doing and what he has been doing and what he will be doing. Here's the point. If God can take a prison and turn it into a church, if God can take betrayal by your brothers and use it for their own salvation, if God can take an enslaved people and turn them into his promised nation, the chosen people, the ones through whom and by whom the Messiah will come. Most clearly, of course, if God can take a crucifixion and turn it into a resurrection, there is literally no elements of our past lives that cannot be part of a hopeful future that God has planned for those who love him. What does this look like practically? Well, what it looks like practically is a stubborn refusal to ever give up hope. See, when you can see it, it's not actually hope. I'm not being hopeful when I assume it's going to be warm in June. It's just how things are. No, hope is when you cannot possibly see how God will use this thing. I am not going to try to explain to you how God will use that ugly thing in your life for your good and his glory in the future, because I don't know. I can't see it. But the reason the resurrection is the central event in history it's because God is showing us what the future holds for all of us, how everything sad will become untrue and renewed. Now, this means hope ought to be our primary characteristic of the people of God. And it means that we look back at our past and we say, I don't know how the Lord is going to use it, but I can't wait to see. It means that like a childlike wonder ought to be what characterizes us. I can't wait to see with the pain that I'm feeling and the grief that I'm experienced, whatever God has planned has got to be greater than I can ask or imagine. See, your past is preparation. And if you give your life over to the Lord, your past is preparation for a future that is brighter and more golden than anything you can dream of. Therefore, brothers and sisters, as we begin a new year, let us hold on with hope to the moments that God gives us. Let us assume that God is currently at work and that if we're breathing today, it's that he's in work at our lives today. And let us see tomorrow if God gives it to us with joyful, expectant hearts. That's our challenge today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all the people said, Amen.